Press play to listen to this article presented by Barclays. Jack Blanchard presented by Send Tips here. Subscribe for free. Listen to Playbook and view in your browser. Good Easter Monday morning. One final glorious day of bank holiday lies ahead before we all go back to oh. Driving the day checkers, mate. A relieved Boris Johnson is recovering at Chequers this morning as the nation marks a truly bleak milestone, with more than 10,000 Britons now dead in the coronavirus outbreak. Fiancé Carrie Simmons is at the PM side today at the Grace and Favour retreat in Buckinghamshire, with Johnson under strict orders to get some rest after his week in hospital with severe COVID-19. But beyond the gates of Chequers the sense of crisis is mounting with the government's own experts warning Britain could be facing the highest death toll in all of Europe. Meanwhile too many NHS doctors and nurses are still struggling to get the protective kit they need to stay safe at work, and questions are mounting about when and how to release the lockdown, which threatens to cripple the UK. Economy for years to come First watch this. If you haven't seen Johnson's deeply personal six-minute video statement after leaving hospital, it really is worth your time, rarely have we just seen a British Prime Minister speak in such terms. The Times, The Telegraph, The Sun and The Express all splash the story this morning, and the clip has already been viewed more than 7 million times. Some viewers, including Health Minister James Bethel, were moved to tears. Most people were just relieved to see the PM sounding so much better. The handful of internet cranks, and, erm, um, senior journalists, suggesting there was something fishy about his wholeness slash recovery really ought to know better. Core video star, writing for Politico, Charlie Cooper reveals Johnson typed out his video tribute to the NHS while still laid up in hospital using a laptop he'd been given by staff to watch movies on. This may give some indication of just how detached, or not, he's likely to be over the days ahead, and as Charlie writes, there are colossal challenges all around him. At Johnson pull through will be a bright spot for the country, but the bigger picture is dark indeed, he says. The task facing Johnson, when he takes full charge of the government again after a period of recuperation, will be to restore confidence in the UK's ability to weather the crisis. Good luck with it, while the PM retains much public sympathy and widespread support in the polls, Tom McTague notes in The Atlantic that coronavirus could yet be the calamity that does for Johnson's legacy. Public sympathy and support for Johnson will, of course, wilt as he returns to work and begins to make the difficult decisions necessary to contain this crisis, get the economy back on track, negotiate Britain's future relationship with the EU, and balance the books, McTague writes. The inevitable public inquiry into the current crisis, and Johnson's handling of it, is unlikely to spare him and his advisers criticism. Britain's performance to date looks to be somewhere between average and distinctly unimpressive, if not far worse. Time to zoom out, the government's stated aim throughout this crisis, reiterated again by Health Secretary Matt Hancock last night, has been to stop the NHS becoming overwhelmed, and on that measure they are apparently succeeding, with ministers rightly proud of the astonishing speed at which the NHS has expanded capacity. Hancock stressed last night that plenty of critical care beds remain available, just as they have throughout this crisis, and yet, more than 10,000 dead inside six weeks tells its own story. Britain watched as the horror show in Italy started to unfold, but here we are, several weeks later, on the same trajectory, the ongoing questions about the UK's overarching strategy cannot be batted away forever. First obvious question, would shutting down Britain earlier have saved lives, as this viral thread from Twitter insists? Last night Dr. Anthony Fauci, the White House's top infectious disease expert, answered exactly that over in the US, where similar criticisms have been aimed at the Trump administration. I mean, obviously, you could logically say that, if you had a process that was ongoing, 
and you started mitigation earlier, you could have saved lives, Dr. Fauci said, in words that will help Johnson's case not one iota. Obviously, no one is going to deny that. But what goes into those kinds of decisions is complicated. But you're right, I mean, obviously, if we had, right from the very beginning, shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. Will any UK minister admit the same? Don't hold your breath, in endless press conferences and TV interviews UK. Ministers have simply batted away every question about their past decisions with the insistence they took the right decisions at the right time, and followed the scientific advice at every stage. What they don't like to engage with is whether a, that advice might have been wrong, and b, whether that advice suddenly changed halfway through March. Business Secretary Alok Sharma was asked about the reported change in direction four times on Sky News yesterday. Four times he refused to answer. Exhibit A, the problem is it's pretty easy to draw back through those first few number 10 press conferences in early March. Here's Chief Scientific Advisor Patrick Valance, for example, telling journalists in Downing Street on March 9 why it was safe for elderly people to keep going to church, one person in a 70,000-seater stadium is not going to infect the stadium, they are going to infect potentially a very few people they are in close contact with, he said, and that's true in any setting. In the house, in a church, in a restaurant or anywhere. So the chance of being infected are about the proximity to the person or people that you're with. That doesn't mean that those are good things to try and stop. When you do that, essentially you are saying stop all interaction, which you can't do and shouldn't do. Really? Three weeks later, the country was put into lockdown. Second obvious question, why did Britain not adopt the test? Trace, isolate approach which has proved so effective at keeping death slow in Germany and South Korea. On the Ma show yesterday the government's own advisor Jeremy Farrar showered praise on Germany's mass testing program. Germany very early on introduced testing, at a scale that was remarkable, and it's continued to do that, and then isolate individuals and look after those who got very sick, he said. And as a result they were able to a, know exactly what was happening with the epidemic in, meaning that they couldn't then transmit it to other people, and I think that has played a key role. And if you think that's impressive, for all Britons, long-standing, obsession with Germany, the truly mind-boggling numbers are in South Korea, a country with nearly 60 million people and a capital city at least as large as London, and which suffered a major outbreak earlier than the UK. As of this morning, only 217 people have died, and the nation is barely even in lockdown. The main lesson we learned is testing is very important, South Korea's ambassador to the UK, told Sky News yesterday. At the beginning of the outbreak we encouraged medical research institutes to develop the testing kits, and we gave them very quick approval. We also encourage Korean companies to build up testing kits, so we had a stockpile. It was the foundation. Will ministers explain why Britain wasn't ready to do the same? Don't hold your breath part 2. BuzzFeed News had a good go at asking this a couple of weeks back, yet even today all we hear from ministers is that they're working hard to ramp up testing as quickly as possible. Again. Their advisors' comments from last month's press conferences are telling. There comes a point in a pandemic when, testing of every case, is not an appropriate intervention, Deputy Chief Medical Officer Jenny Harries said on March 26. Although we still do some contact tracing and testing, for example in high-risk areas like prisons and care homes, that is not an appropriate mechanism as we go forward. There were plenty of people questioning her comments at the time, but three weeks on, with Britain's death toll now 50 times higher than South Korea's, those questions will only get louder. Coming attractions, while Labour's new leader Keir Starmer is for now carefully refusing to criticise the government's past decisions, insisting he wants to be constructive, 
Johnson and his senior aides must know that all of this is coming down the track. The virus outbreak may now be reaching its peak, but in Westminster, the political fallout has barely begun. Now read this, Politico's Ben White, Victoria Guida and Matthew Karnishnig take you inside the global race to prevent a coronavirus depression, from the White House and the US, Federal Reserve, to the German Chancellery, and inside the European Central Bank. A message from Barclays, we've just announced the establishment of the Barclays Foundation which will provide a COVID-19 community aid package of £100 million to charities working to support vulnerable people impacted by the pandemic. Lockdown nation before all that, the first question that really does need to be answered this week is over the lockdown extension, given under law ministers must decide by Thursday if they want to extend their powers. The Times Splash reports that the government's scientific advisers will meet tomorrow to discuss the latest evidence, before a formal decision is made on Thursday. A government source confirms to the paper that the decision is a formality, given the number of daily deaths from the disease. We won't be easing restrictions any time soon, the source said. Back in the game, The Guardian reckons Johnson is likely to be signing off the big decisions, and having watched his online speech last night it's hard to disagree, sources with knowledge of no. 10 said it was very unlikely that major decisions about reviewing and lengthening the lockdown would now be taken without at least some input from the Prime Minister, Rowena Mason reports. The Telegraph hears the same, with a cabinet source telling Harry York, the Prime Minister has to take the decision. Any lockdown will have huge implications, and the PM will be responsible for it, so he's got to be the one taking that decision. However another source urges caution, I don't think the cabinet wants to be pulling the prime minister out of his recovery and risking him getting worse, they say. How it's going to work, there was loads of important detail on the lockdown in Tim Shipman's big write-through in the Sunday Times yesterday, which said the new contact tracing app being developed by the NHS will be central to the strategy. The lockdown will be lifted sector by sector rather than on a geographical basis or by letting young people resume normal life first, Shipman wrote. Cabinet remains split between those members who want the lockdown to begin to lift after the first May bank holiday on May 8, and those who think that it is better left until after the second one on May 25th, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, SAGE will meet on Thursday to try to determine the effect the lockdown has had on infections and deaths. Ministers expect it will then take a further week or 10 days for the cabinet to come up with a plan. Watch this space. In the meantime, fears of widespread disobedience over the Easter weekend appear to have been misplaced, with most Britons sensibly observing social distancing rules despite the, mostly, Lovely weather, the Times has a roundup of some of the few transgressions, while the Telegraph spent a day on the front line with police in Wales working hard to keep the beaches clear. But there are no reports of mass trespasses in the Derbyshire hills, nor of thousands of people fleeing cities to set up camp in their second homes. Speaking of second homes, playbook suspects we will not be seeing Communities Secretary Robert Jenrick at a Downing Street press conference any time soon after a weekend of accusations that he breached his own social distancing guidelines, at first Jenrick's insistence that he had simply finished work in London and returned to the family home in Herefordshire seemed reasonable enough until the Daily Mail spoke to neighbours who said it was Cod's wallop that he spent most of his time there. The fact his own website says the family live in Southwell near Newark, and in London, neither of which, to be clear, are anywhere near Herefordshire, only makes matters worse. On the run, the latest minister facing questions is Michael Gove, whom the Mail spotted out for a weekend jog when he was thought to be in self-isolation after his daughter became ill.
Diamond Walters reports that Gove initially claimed he was allowed out for exercise, but then changed his story when it was pointed out this does not apply to families in self-isolation. A source close to Gove then said he had in fact sought a test for his daughter, on the advice of the chief medical officer. A source close to Gove said, he sought the CMO's advice about what he should do at the suggestion of officials, given he's one of the cabinet ministers leading the COVID-19 response. On Monday, the CMO advised that Michael's daughter should be tested after displaying mild symptoms. She was tested on Tuesday and the result came back negative on Wednesday afternoon, at which point the household isolation rules no longer applied to the family. News from the front line, there's another raft of worrying stories about NHS kit shortages in the papers this morning, including a Daily Mail splash about imported PP kit from China being held up due to red tape or concerns about quality. The Times reports doctors are having to reuse protective visors, and that crucial anesthetics and painkillers are now running low in intensive care wards. The Sun meanwhile has obtained a letter from staff at Watford General Hospital, saying staff are worried by minimal PP and inconsolable after a colleague died at home following a long shift, coming attractions, all of this and more should start to be debated next week in Britain's new look virtual parliament, which is shaping up to be the most exciting innovation we've seen in SW1 since the arrival of Greg's vegan sausage rolls. No final decisions have been made on how it's going to work, but both The Telegraph and The Sun reckon Speaker Lindsay Hoyle will sit alone in the Commons chamber, with MPs and ministers participating via video link. Ministers would be required to appear for ministerial question time sessions, urgent questions and other business relating to the House Commons, but would do so remotely, The Telegraph's Harry York reports. The Speaker would continue to select MPs to ask the questions, as well as taking points of order, in the event that votes are required, options for electronic voting are also being looked at. Alt. Option, The Times however reckons another option under consideration would see a Minister and Shadow Minister in the Chamber, along with the Speaker. MPs would use a messaging system to ask if they could intervene in the debate, and they would be muted unless they were directly asking a question, Stephen Swinford reports. One option being considered is for a large screen to be erected opposite the dispatch box. Labour land Labour leak meltdown, the fragile sense of unity within the Labour Party following the election of Gear Starmer has been shattered this weekend by the leak of an 850-page internal report savaging former senior staffers who it claims were working against Jeremy Corbyn for much of his tenure. The confidential report was compiled in the weeks before Starmer's election and was allegedly intended to be the party's submission to the forthcoming Equality and Human Rights Commission inquiry into anti-Semitism within Labour. But Sky News' Tom Rayner, who first obtained the leaked report and published a story on its contents on Saturday night, says the party's own lawyers prevented it from being sent to the EHRC, fearing it would damage their case. The party says it was never intended for the EHRC. But never mind that, the report is now being widely circulated in Labour circles via WhatsApp, with multiple news outlets writing up stories yesterday including The Guardian and Labour List. It has since been published online and Playbook was sent a copy last night, but will not be sharing the link due to questions about the privacy and confidentiality of those named within, whose names are not redacted. But naturally that hasn't stopped plenty of animated discussion on social media of its contents, chiefly regarding what appears to be an extraordinary leak of private WhatsApp conversations between former senior staffers speaking about Corbyn and his inner circle in the most brutally offensive terms. Not impressed, allies of Corbyn have seized on the report to insist his narrow election defeat in 2017 could have been a victory had senior staffers not been trying to sabotage his bid for no. 10. Solidarity with every Labour member who slogged their guts out in 2017 to build a kinder, 
Fairer Society, tweeted Labour frontbencher Dan Cardin. How different things could have been. Former Shadow Cabinet Minister Richard Bergen added, We would have won in 2017 without all the sabotage, imagine how different our country could have been. Labour members, who give up their spare time to fight for a better society and get a Labour government, have my utmost respect, others showed their true colours. Fallout, this all poses quite a headache for new leader Keir Starmer who is barely mentioned in the report but must swiftly decide how he is going to respond to its contents. There are also potential implications for any of the senior staffers mentioned within who might have hoped to return to Labour HQ, now Corbyn and his aides have departed. A message from Barclays, we've created a £100 million COVID-19 community aid package to support vulnerable people impacted by COVID-19, working with charity partners here in the UK and around the world to deliver help where it's needed most. Find out more. Meet the, not-so-new, shadow cabinet better late than never, right? This is the final tranche, Ian Murray. Shadow Scottish Secretary, easiest appointment in town as Labour's only Scottish MP. Arch critic of Jeremy Corbyn and wore it as a badge of honour. Clung limpet like to Edinburgh South last year as the SNP swept away his Scottish Labour colleagues, just as he did in 2015. Profile boosted by a deputy leadership campaign which won endorsements from Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. Properly funny and does a mean line in pub quizzes, currently via Zoom. Unclear if they'll have to stop now he's got a proper job, near Griffith, Shadow Wales Secretary, demotion for Corbyn's Shadow Defence Secretary but retains a seat at Starmer's top table. Trod the careful path under Corbyn, somehow keeping him in line on NATO and Trident without managing to get herself fired. Multilinguist former teacher with a first from Oxford in modern languages under her belt. One of only six MPs in the shadow cabinet elected pre-2010. Irish born but of true Welsh stock, Louise Hay, interim shadow Northern Ireland secretary, in the shadow cabinet for now, at least with previous post holder Tony Lloyd in hospital with COVID-19. Popular Sheffield MP promoted from shadow policing role, very good on telly and trusted by Team Corbyn to go out to bat on the media, even though she backed Owen Smith for leader in 2016. Youngest member of the new shadow cabinet at just 32, tipped as a future leader. Always good for a laugh. Marsha de Cordova, Shadow Women and Equalities Secretary, charity worker who secured the upset of the night in 2017 by ousting Treasury Minister Jane Ellison in Battersea, became Shadow Disabilities Minister under Corbyn, now promoted to Starmer's top team. Born with the eye condition nystagmus and is registered blind. Campaigns tirelessly to make Parliament more accessible to those with visual impairments, raised by a single mum in Bristol alongside five siblings. Brother Bobby plays up front for Fulham FC. Rosanu Alan Khan, Shadow Mental Health Minister, breakout star of the deputy leadership contest, punting Corbynista candidate Richard Bergen into a humiliating third place. Boxing enthusiast A&E doctor who pulls a mean turn at karaoke after hours. Tooting MP who remains close to her predecessor Sadiq Khan. Other was a singer in a chart-topping 70s Polish girl band, Dad was a TV repairman from Pakistan, speaks four languages. Used to model Adidas trainers. Still only 43. Frankly the sky is the limit. Charlie Faulkner, Shadow Attorney General, unexpected return to the top table for Tony Blair's flatmate from back in the day, ought to be an MP but blew the safe seat lined up for him in 1997 by refusing to take his kids out of public school. Blair made him appear instead, served as Lord Chancellor and then Justice Secretary through the noughties, describing himself as the only new Labour minister who would drink at lunchtime.
then shed 5 stone on turning 60 by existing on a diet of apples plus 8 or 9 cans of Diet Coke a day. Media Round Shadow Cabinet Office Minister Rachel Reeves Broadcast Round, BBC Breakfast, 7.20am, Today Programme, 7.50am, LBC Radio, 8am. Also on the Today Programme, Scottish Health Secretary Jean Freeman, 7.20am, also on BBC Breakfast, National Clinical Director of the Scottish Government Jason Leach, 7.30am. Also on Nick Ferrari at Breakfast, LBC Radio, The Royal College of Nursing's Mike Adams, 8am, Breakfast with Julia Hartley Brewer, Talk Radio, Labour MP Lloyd Russell Moyle, 8.20am, NHS Confederation Boss Neil Dixon, 9.05am. Reviewing the papers tonight, BBC News Channel, 10.40pm. And 11.30pm, The Daily Telegraph's Christopher Hope and The Guardian's Dawn Foster, Sky News, 10.30pm. And 11.30pm, Less Editor Stig Gable, Spiked Online's Ella Whelan and Times columnist Matthew Paris. Today's front pages, click on the publication's name to see its front page. Daily Express, My Survival Was Powered By Love. Daily Mirror, UK, Worst In Europe. Daily Mail, Fiasco Of NHS Safety Kit Flights From China. Daily Star, Stay Away Ross, Let Us Do Our Job, Nurse and Family Slam Star Filming In ICU, Financial Times, G20 Nations Close To Ceiling Debt Deal For Poor Countries. The Daily Telegraph. For 48 hours things could have gone either way for me. The Guardian, Ministers under fire over protective kit as UK, death toll reaches 10,000. The Independent, 10,000 deaths, UK faces worst total in Europe. The Sun, Bojo's Angels. The Times, things could have gone either way, says Johnson. London calling Westminster weather, sun behind cloud, sunny with clouds, sun. A bit of cloud around this morning, but giving way to another lovely sunny afternoon. Much cooler though, with highs of only 12 C. Happy birthday to, Shadow Prisons Minister Lynn Brown, who turned 60, Scottish Deputy First Minister John Swinney, former Labour MP David Drew. Playbook couldn't happen without, my editors Ora Sheftilovich and producer Anna Busquets Guardia. Subscribe to the Politico newsletter family, Brussels Playbook, London Playbook, EU Confidential, Sunday Crunch, EU Influence, AI, Decoded, DC, Playbook, all our Politico Pro Policy Morning Newsletters Let's Block Ads. Why?